Welcome to your AP Statistics Chapter 21, Video 1. We're going to learn more about tests and intervals. Zero in on the null. Null hypotheses have special requirements. To perform a hypothesis test, the null must be a statement about the value of a parameter for a model. We then use this value to compute the probability that the observed sample statistic or something either further from the null value might occur. How do we choose the null hypothesis? The appropriate null arises directly from the context of the problem. It is not dictated by the data, but instead by the situation. One good way to identify both the null and alternative hypotheses is to think about the why of the situation. To write a null hypothesis, you can't just choose any parameter value you like. The null must relate to the question at hand. It is context dependent. There is a temptation to state your claim as the null hypothesis. However, you cannot prove a null hypothesis true. So it makes more sense to use what you want to show as the alternative. This way, when you reject the null, you are left with what you want to show. A p-value is a conditional probability. Okay, This is that, that probability that, that we want to calculate that is the probability of the observed statistic given that the null hypothesis is true. The p-value is not the probability that the null hypothesis is true. It's the probability of the observed statistic given that the null hypothesis is true. It's not even the conditional probability that the null hypothesis is true given the data. Okay, It's the probability of the observed statistic given that the null hypothesis is true. So be careful to interpret the p-value correctly. What do you do with a high p-value? When we see a small p-value, we could continue to believe that the null, to believe the null hypothesis is, and conclude we just witnessed a rare event. But instead, we trust the data and use it as evidence to reject the null hypothesis. However, big p-values just mean what we observed isn't surprising. That is, the results are now in line with our assumption that the null hypothesis models the world. So we have no reason to reject it. A big p-value doesn't prove that the null hypothesis is true, but it certainly offers no evidence that it's not true. Thus, when we see a large p-value, all we can say is that we don't reject the null hypothesis. It, the data are consistent with what the null hypothesis states. Alpha levels. Sometimes we need to make a firm decision about whether or not to reject the null hypothesis. When the p-value is small, it tells us that our data are rare given the null hypothesis. But how rare is rare? How much evidence are we going to require? We could define rare event arbitrarily by setting a threshold for our p-value. If our p-value falls below that point, we'll reject the null hypothesis. We call such results statistically significant. The threshold is called an alpha le level denoted by the Greek letter alpha. Common alpha levels are one-tenth, five-hundredths, and one-hundredth. You have an option, almost an obligation, to consider your alpha level carefully and choose an appropriate one for the situation. The alpha level is also called the significance level. When we reject the null hypothesis, we say that the test is significant at that particular level. So if we select 5%, we would say it's significant at the 5% level. What can you say if the p-value does not fall, fall below alpha? You should say that the data have failed to provide sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Don't say that you accept the null hypothesis because that would indicate that you have evidence for it. And that's not really the case. You have evidence that's not against it. Recall that in a jury trial, if we do not find the defendant guilty, we say the defendant is not guilty. We don't say the defendant is innocent. The p-value gives the reader far more information than just stating that you reject or fail to reject the null. In fact, by providing a p-value to the reader, you allow that person to, to make his or her own decisions about the test. What you consider to be statistically significant might not be the same as what someone else consider, considers statistically significant. There is more than one alpha level that can be used, but each test will give only one p-value. What do we mean when we say that a test is statistically significant? 
All we mean is that the test statistic had a p-value lower than our alpha value. That's it. Don't be lulled into thinking that statistical significance carries with it any sense of practical importance or impact. Significant versus important. For large samples, even small, unimportant, insignificant deviations from the null hypothesis can be statistically significant. Okay? There, there could be a definite difference, but it may not be big enough for anybody to care. On the other hand, if the sample is not large enough, even large financially or scientifically significant differences may not be statistically significant. It's good practice to report the magnitude of the difference between the observed statistic value and the null hypothesis value in the data units, along with the p-value on which we base statistical significance. That way, the reader can interpret what practical significance goes along with it. Confidence intervals and hypothesis tests are built from the same calculations. They have the same assumptions and conditions. You can approximate a hypothesis test by examining a, a confidence interval. Just ask whether the null hypothesis value is consistent with a confidence interval for the parameter at the corresponding co confidence level. Because confidence intervals are two-sided, they correspond to two-sided tests. In general, a confidence interval with a confidence level of C% percent corresponds to a two-sided hypothesis test with an alpha level of 100 minus C%. Percent. So if we're talking about 95% confidence, that would correspond to 100% minus 95% or 5% alpha level. The, uh, the relationship between confidence intervals and a one-sided hypothesis test is a little more complicated because you got to um, divide by two or multiply by a half. So a confidence interval with a confidence level of C% percent corresponds to a one-sided hypothesis test with the level alpha level of one-half times one minus C%. Percent. So for 95% confidence, if you want to consider just either the greater than or the less than alternative, it would correspond to half of 5%, so a 2.5% alpha level. A 95% confidence intervals for small samples. Um, when the success failure condition fails, all is not lost. A simple adjustment to the calculation lets us make the confidence interval anyway. All we do is add four funny uh, observations, two successes and two failures. So instead of p hat equals y over n, we use the adjusted proportion. Um, we don't actually have to do this in AP stat, but I just wanted you to see that this is something that people can do. And so that's kind of cool that they can make up for the fact that the success failure condition fails, but we're not going to spend a lot of time with this. And so I'm just going to skip over that next slide. Don't feel like you have to make any notes on that. Okay, making errors. Here's some shocking news for you. Nobody's perfect. Even with lots of evidence, we can still make the wrong decision. When we perform a hypothesis test, we can make mistakes in two ways. Okay, this doesn't mean we've made a mistake like in our calculations or that we've messed up the process. Even if we, this is assuming we do the process absolutely correctly. Okay, our process is correct. We can still be wrong. Either the null hypothesis is true, but we mistakenly reject it. We just happen to get one of those rare events and we take it as evidence um, that the null hypothesis is false, but in reality it's true. That happens, and that can happen um, exactly alpha percent of the time, and we'll talk about that in a minute. That's a type 1 error. The other thing that can happen is the null hypothesis is false, but we fail to reject it. We get that's called a type 2 error. So that would be we, our data give us a statistic that is, um, you know, consistent with the null hypothesis. We end up with a large p-value, but the reality is it's false. That's a type 2 error. Again, these are not errors like mistakes that we've made along the way in our calculations. We've done the test correctly. These are just possible errors that our test can lead us to make. Which type of error is more serious depends on the situation at hand. In other words, the gravity of the error is context dependent. Here's an illustration of the four situations in a hypothesis test. So up here, we've got the truth. Okay, now the truth is unknown to us. If we knew the truth, we wouldn't be doing hypothesis tests to begin with. All right, the truth, let's say the truth is the null hypothesis is true. Okay, well, one of two things can happen. Either we get a really small p-value, 
And so we reject our null. Well, if it's really true, we've made a type 1 error. Or we get a p-value large enough that we've retained the null. We don't reject it. Well, then we've done a good job. Okay, we've, we've, Our test has worked in leading us to the truth. Now, let's consider the other possibility. The null is really false. So our decision is based on, correctly based on, say, a small p-value. So we reject the null. So everything's good. We, we figured out the truth. Or it could be that we just happen to get a sample that gives us a large p-value. So we don't reject the null. We retain it. Well, then we've made a type 2 error because the null is actually false. So those are the four possible things that can happen. How often will a type 1 error occur? Since type 1 error is rejecting a true hy null hypothesis, the probability of a type 1 error is our alpha level. So once you set your alpha level, you're, you're setting your probability for a type 1 error. When the null is false and we reject it, we have done the right thing. Okay, that's what we want. And in fact, that's really the whole reason we we're doing a hypothesis test to begin with, because we think the alternative is true. We want evidence against the null. So this is great, and this is what the focus is really on. So a test's ability to detect a false hypothesis is called the power of the test. When the null is false and we fail to reject it, we have made a type 2 error. We assign the letter beta to the probability of this mistake. It's harder to assess the value of beta because we don't know what the value of the parameter really is. There's no single value for beta. We can think of a whole collection of betas, one for each incorrect parameter value. One way to focus our attention on a particular beta is to think about the effect size. Ask how big of a difference would matter. Once we have the answer, the beta for the corresponding alternative could be calculated. We could reduce beta for all alternative parameter values by increasing alpha. This would reduce beta, or probability of a type 2 error, but increase the chance of a type 1 error. The tension between type 1 and type 2 errors is inevitable. The only way to reduce both types of errors is to collect more data. Otherwise, we just uh, wind up trading one for the other. Okay, the power of a test is the probability that it correctly rejects a false null hypothesis. When the power is high, we can be confident that we've looked hard enough at this situation. The power of a test is 1 minus beta, because beta is the probability that a test fails to reject a false null hypothesis, and the power is the probability that it does reject a false null hypothesis. So that's going to be something you need to know, is that beta plus power is equal to 1. Okay, so if you know 1, you just subtract it from the value of 1 to get the other. Whenever a study fails to reject its null hypothesis, the test power comes into question. When we calculate power, we imagine that the null hypothesis is false. The value of the power depends on how far the truth lies from the null hypothesis value. The distance between the null hypothesis value, P0, and the truth, P, is called the effect size. Power depends directly on effect size. A picture is worth a thousand words. The larger the effect size, the easier it should be to see it. Obtaining a larger sample size decreases the probability of type 2 error, so it increases the, hour, uh, the power. So that's great. So larger sample size decreases probability of type 2 error, which then increases power because those two always add up to 1. It also makes sense that the more we're willing to accept a type 1 error, the less likely we'll be, we will be to make a type 2 error. So this diagram shows the relationship between the concepts. So here is the curve that we're using for our hypothesis test because it assumes that the null hypothesis is true. Here's alpha. This would be for a one-sided test, a greater than test. And as long as our p-value is less than alpha, which means our p-hat would be somewhere over here, our p-value would be smaller than the alpha, we would reject the null. If our p-value is larger than alpha, so our p-hat is anywhere over here, we would end up with a big p-value, and we would um, fail to reject the null. Now, 
if the null hypothesis is really true, we've got it set up awesome. The only place we can make an error is over here. If the null hypothesis is really false, here's the probability of our error. It's this beta, okay? Because we're going under this assumption up here and we're going to end up with a big old p-value, so we're going to retain the null if our p-hat is anywhere over here. You can just come up here and see what would happen. Oh, okay, we're going to retain the null. But look, if this is really the truth, we're in trouble, okay? Because um, if we get a value over here and we don't reject the null, we're believing the wrong thing. But if we get a value anywhere over here, this is the power. Because all of this over here under this curve corresponds to everything under here where alpha is. Okay? So here's the relationship. So this is also why beta plus power equals 1. All right. We're going to come back in just a minute and talk about reducing both type 1 and type 2 error. And then we're going to look at a couple of examples. So I'll see you in a few.